So, um, I think all of you are pretty familiar with Brett and have met him and talked to him before, so I think we're going to skip the, the, the detailed introduction, but Brett has been active in, just a quick introduction, Brett has been active in progressive politics in Rhode Island for a long time, helping out on a range of campaigns uh, in a number of different capacities uh, and a number of different progressive groups. And he is currently running for mayor of Providence. He is a campaign finance professional whose business, uh, CFO Compliance, uh, has uh, done a number of important um, campaign finance work. One of the things closest to my heart is some of his interns helped us out, or employees helped us out, with our challenge against the NRA in Rhode Island, which was very successful. So got to work with his employees who were great and very helpful and donated their time pro bono, which I'm very grateful for. So I think we'd like to start by going through a couple of key questions. And one of the key questions, one of the most important questions for us is about taxes. Um, on your questionnaire, you said that you were undecided on the question, uh, the statewide question for the 2006 tax cuts for the rich. And uh, I think what we're most concerned about in Providence is a couple of specific proposals to make Providence's tax structure more progressive. And one of the ones that's most important is uh, a municipal income tax. So you're probably familiar with the use in other states, um, but the idea basically is income taxes are more progressive than property taxes. And um, states, uh, cities like New York City have them. And I'm wondering if you would support uh, pressuring the General Assembly to allow Providence to levy a municipal income tax? Uh, you know, I, I generally support additional local control and local flexibility and, and for example, opposed the, uh, I forget whose amendment it was, on the, on, the, on the minimum wage proposal because I think that municipalities should have the ability to pursue. Uh, to set their own uh, floors and ceilings and minimum standards. Uh, and so uh, while I, you know, depending on what the kind of bill, if it were enabling legislation, is the kind of thing that I conceivably could support, uh, but a specific income tax for Providence at this time is not something that I would support. Uh, I think that we need to uh, be really mindful about taxation in the city uh, and start to address the most regressive taxes in the city, which for me starts with the car tax. And uh, those who can least afford to pay it, uh, pay it disproportionately. Those uh, people who have outdated vehicles, in addition to the fact that it uh, incentivizes people to hold on to older cars, which are usually more polluting cars, uh, it, it's also uh, unfair to those uh, who can't afford it. And you know, I was doing a house party in South Providence with African refugees. Uh, and <laughs> it was kind of like, you know, out of the mouths of new Americans, you know, the, 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 the truest kernels of, of wisdom came and people were appalled and they were just, they couldn't believe it when they moved here that, not that they had to keep paying taxes on a car that they already owned every year. And they're right to be appalled. And, and, and a priority for me in terms of city taxation instead of any sort of new taxation is the phasing out of the most regressive tax, which is the car tax. So we need to start to inch up that exemption in a fiscally responsible way. Uh, the other thing on the car tax that's important to people uh, is uh, when people get their car tax bill, they see the valuation of their car, and most people are <laughs> are deeply offended by what the city thinks their vehicle is worth, and uh, and and uh, and so we need to also get to a more sensible valuation of vehicles so that people don't feel like they're getting ripped off or abused uh, for a valuation that's totally unpredictable or or un not based in reality. So. Let me ask you a specific proposal about the car tax. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously, whenever you talk about lowering taxes, uh, there's always the question of where the money comes from. Mm -hmm. And when the car tax proposal, uh, the exemption was raised after the state cut the reimbursement funds, mm -hmm. one of the things that the city did was lowered the rate. So effectively, people with cars that were worth more than about 25000 wound up paying uh, a lower rate. And people with cars worth less than 25000 wound up paying a higher rate. Would you support um, reinstating the rate, raising the rate in order to fund a lowering of the exemption? Uh, I'd consider it uh, because I really do think that the people for whom we need to help ease the burden are those with the least valuable cars. And so uh, at the end of the day, if you have a brand new BMW, 
I don't lose a lot of sleep over assessing a car tax bill. Uh, and so uh, the people who we need to help first are those with the least valuable vehicles who are often uh, those least able to pay. And so it's something I would consider. Okay. Um, a couple other uh, proposals to make the, the province's tax structure more progressive. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, of the uh, perhaps more controversial ones recently was a proposal to lower the penalty assessed or the higher rate assessed on rental properties um, because renters are lower income. Mm -hmm. This makes provinces tax structure more regressive. Mm -hmm. uh, and the proponents behind the proposal are looking to fund it uh, largely through uh, removal of tax stabilization money. So I'm wondering, uh, the tax, we're getting to tax stabilizations uh, soon, so don't worry if any tax stabilization fans are chomping at the bit. Um, but um, I'm wondering if you supported that proposal. Um, so I support lowering the, the so-called landlord tax, the non-owner-occupied residential tax. Uh, I, what I did not support was the council's move to do it without identifying where they were going to pay for it. Because whoever the next mayor is is now inheriting a $6 million deficit uh, with with no clear instructions on how to do it. But the, the non-owner-occupied residential rate is absolutely uh, unfair and un non-competitive with its neighbors. So I think that's a very important point because it's important to, to pay for things. So do you have specific proposals to raise tax revenue in a progressive way? Uh, I do not. I have not in the campaign supported and do not currently support raising any new taxes next year. Uh, I think what we need to be focused on is better delivery of basic city services and for increased advocacy for state financing of uh, the city of Providence. You know, 51% of the land here is tax exempt. Many of those tax exempt properties are statewide assets, uh, the hospitals, the universities, state government. Uh, they all consume city services. And, and when they create a job, when Brown University or Lifespan uh, or the state itself creates a new job, the income tax and sales tax revenue derived from those new jobs go to the state. And yet when the fire alarm goes off, um, the city, us taxpayers, pay for the fire truck to go and service that call. And so the state needs to participate more in how they reimburse the city or partner with the city in terms of tax reimbursements or, or tax partnerships or cash payments, however you want to conceive of it. Uh, and so I, I think, at least right now, we're at a point where we cannot assess additional taxes at the local level, uh, but rather need to focus on better delivery of services and stronger partnership with the state. Okay, so I think that's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very important point. So your, your position is that you don't support um, raising any progressive taxes. Now what I'm, what I'm curious about is whether you would support that if it uh, does not represent an overall raise of taxes. So for instance, other proposals, you suggested that you wanted to lower the regressive car tax, which I think is many, something that many people in this room agree with. I'm wondering if um, you're interested in funding that with a progressive tax uh, proposal. Or is the idea is that that should be paid for with um, spending cuts, or maybe when revenue rises in the future, what's the what's the correct? Yeah, I think that the the phasing, the raising of the exemption to, to therefore start to lower the effective rate on car taxpayers needs to be funded through either savings or an expanding tax base. All right, so let's move on to another. Uh, tax question, which is the tax stabilization agreements, mm -hmm. which are a very controversial topic in Providence politics that wonkish people love to talk about. Um, so what a tax stabilization agreement is, is essentially when a new development goes up that would expand uh, the value of a certain property, a tax stabilization agreement um, lowers those taxes uh, for a period of time set out in the agreement. And the theory is eventually the rate will rise to the full rate. There are questions about whether this happens in practice. Um, and one of the uh, larger tax stabilizations, uh, Cornish Associates, which provides some of the, which built some of the large apartments, apartment buildings downtown, uh, is currently seeking an extension of their tax stabilizations. Uh, do you support that proposal? So the city never should have 
negotiated TSAs that had a cliff in them, whereby they weren't slowly phased up to full taxation. I think it's crazy to expect a business to be able to pay discounted taxes for a period of years at a fixed cap, and then suddenly the next year be able to pay twice, triple the amount. And it was irresponsible of, it was Mayor Cicilline who started that, uh, to, to negotiate those agreements that did not include a gradual uh, phasing in of taxation so that we weren't put in this position of, of having a gun held to our head about, tax, about renewal or not. Uh, the, I'm highly skeptical of renewing those plans as is uh, because where does it end? When does it stop? Right? If, 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 the, if the project is unable to be economically viable at full taxation, then maybe the project's just not economically viable. And so, um, that said, I think that there are all alternatives, and if the investor were willing to uh, perhaps spend new monies to further improve the property, or uh, include additional development that would increase the tax, broaden the tax base, uh, I think that there are, are ways in which you can negotiate a renewal that was had something in it for the taxpayer as well. Uh, but as far as I know, at this point, uh, that's not part of the conversation. Okay, um, so now let's get into talking about um, transit policy. So Ed has a question about a specific transit issue that we would like to ask. Or a couple. Um, I'm a member of the Ripta Riders Alliance, and we have been uh, more than a little distressed at what's happening to Kennedy Plaza. How would you deal with the upheaval associated with that? Yeah, so I'm happy to have had a chance to meet with Barry and Randall, I think last week, maybe? Yes, yeah, sir. I think last week. Yeah. And it's all, they're all a bit of a blur these days, but the... Uh, For us, too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I think that the state and the city uh, got the timing and the sequencing all wrong and put the cart before the horse vis-a-vis -vis this transit bond. Uh, I am a strong supporter of the idea of a bus hub at the Providence Station. Thank you. And, uh, and if that were a robust hub, then I would have less misgivings about the current Kennedy Plaza project. Uh, and so the, the reason in which it's kind of the cart before the horse is we don't know if that's going to pass yet. Uh, and I will say as an aside that, uh, you know, I had intended to spend, frankly, I had intended to spend whether or not I was the nominee, although of course I'm hoping that I will be, I had intended to spend October campaigning for its passage, having worked on past band, bond issues. Uh, now we may be slightly distracted by Buddy Cianci, but nevertheless, um, I think we all need to work together to make sure that that bond issue passes. And, uh, and so I have serious concerns about the Kennedy Plaza project. Uh, I, uh, if that bond were to fail, uh, the idea of reducing capacity for the central bus hub for the state at the same time that ridership is increasing. Uh, at the same time that ridership is increasing, and frankly, with a desire to increase transit options overall, personally, uh, that it's concerning to me. There's also a social justice component that's concerning to me, which is I think that there is a uh, very thinly veiled uh, goal amongst particularly the corporate sponsors to displace certain uh, either yeah. transit riders or homeless folks or We've noticed. Uh, loiterers, however you want to define it. Now that's not to say that I have, you know, the tolerance for criminality in Kennedy Plaza, I don't think any of us do. Uh, but but uh, but those who are, you know, law-abiding citizens and they want to spend the day in the park, they have the right to do so. Uh, and certainly, uh, uh, I think, strategic and intentional displacement with no plan for where those dis displaced folks may go uh, is troubling. And, and so uh, I've, I've made my skepticism clear in interviews on the radio and in the press uh, I will continue to do that. I think that uh, the ability to raise private money to help pay for a public good is great. Uh, but if that comes with strings attached that start to compromise core values, is a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I feel a little bit in a bind in that, you know, the things 
the bulldozers have started, uh, but the, uh, we need to pass that, that transportation law. We need to do many things. One of the things we're proposing is just suspending construction until the new administration takes office. And, and maybe we can talk about how that would work, because I've seen asphalt dug up already. Would we be able yes. to resume operations? Um, we do need to talk about how that would work. We're having the same problem. Yeah. Um, one more specific question. In uh, their effort to speed up the R line so that it hauls more people, they are eliminating stops. And one of our members uh, got out of St. Joseph's Hospital uh, a couple days ago. Uh, went to what used to be the stop at St. Joseph's Hospital, saw yellow tape around it, which is an improvement over no yellow tape, uh, and walked past five more stops before she found one that the bus stopped at. What's your take on that? So, uh, the challenge for RIPTA, as you well know, is is sustainable funding, mm -hmm. and and I am very interested in being a, an advocate for and a partner in finding that sustainable funding. Uh, that is what we need, right? And uh, in addition to government subsidy, one of the ways in which we get towards sustainability is having more full fare passengers, and. Uh, the idea is that the R line will attract more, more full fare passengers because service will be uh, faster and, and more that desirable. That is the idea. That is the idea. And so that is the balance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, between uh, passengers who can help lead us towards a better and more sustainable funding stream and more frequent stops which discourage riders who may have, a dis may have the option to drive or to take other means of transportation. And how we find that balance is through listening to riders, which is why the commitment that I made to Barry and that I will make to you, you all, uh, in addition to you, Ed, personally, is that uh, you know, we get an appointment on the board and, uh, and that the riders' concerns and advocates like Ripter riders will have a seat at my table so that we can help strike the right balance and by listening to riders for where that sweet spot is. Because I don't think the answer is all one way or the other. Uh, but those who should be having input on that are those who are actually transit users, as opposed to accountants or other policymakers. Uh, and so I think that's the answer. I have a question along with the uh, along with that. Do you think that um, students who live in Providence, go to school in Providence, should be able to have free buses, free bus fare from seven to three? The Providence public school students or college students? Providence public school students. Uh, so uh, I was a part of the uh, PSU, you know, take the walk challenge, and was a supporter like. Uh, like the rest of us, I guess, of, of shrinking the busing radius um, so that we can provide additional transportation to high school students. Uh, but what we did, uh, actually, in a, a moment of, uh, of good thinking at uh, the Wild Colonial, Steve, uh, is uh, also came up with uh, a, what I thought was an easily actionable short-term solution uh, that was more affordable and recognized the burden that the students put on other transit riders, because this is another area where there's a balance to be struck, uh, which was by recognizing that the issue for students getting to school is not just distance of walk, but quality of walk, and that a two and a half or a three mile walk on a 70 degree sunny day is very different than a two and a half mile walk uh, on the day we all took that walk together, which was icy and freezing. And so uh, we, we put out a substantive and affordable, far more affordable proposal than shrinking the busing radius to do uh, 
uh, kind of like they do ozone action days to do a foul weather day for PPS so that the school department could notify students the night before that tomorrow was going to be a foul weather day and that students could ride the bus for free that day. And so that it wasn't an across the board every school day of the year, but rather on days that it was extreme hot, extreme cold, rain, uh, or other adverse conditions that on those days, and, and, and the reason that we proposed that, one, because it was more affordable, and two, was because of the, the concerns about the quality of ride for other transit riders. We met with, whereas the other candidates just kind of instantly committed without actually putting the research in, we actually met with RIPTA. Uh, we met with RIPTA leadership, we met with the city planning department and school department to say what's affordable and what's actionable. And what RIPTA said was we don't have enough buses to accommodate these additional kids. Uh, but what they do have is a reserve of buses that they keep in, in stock in case of breakdowns that they could responsibly activate for one-off days like this. So, so that at 7 and at 5, limited, so I'd like to get a couple other it wasn't squeezing out of traditional riders. Um, so one of the other uh, key transit issues uh, relates to bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. In the last uh, transportation bond, the vast majority of the funds were devoted to uh, car infrastructure. And um, a number of transit activists would like to see uh, a portion of the funds in the next bond issue uh, devoted to bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. The number a lot of people are talking about is 25% because that's essentially the number of people who uh, don't own a car. So would you be willing to commit to 25% of the transportation bond issues uh, under your administration going to bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure? So I, not knowing what the scale of the bond is or when this bond would be, I can't commit to a specific number, but I've been quite clear from the beginning, uh, if anybody's followed the Transport PVD blog, uh, we've had by far the most detailed and thoughtful responses to that. It, it, transportation priorities for me extend far beyond vehicular travel. And so uh, bike infrastructure, uh, additional transit, bus transit, uh, and and uh, and other you know the potential for other transit in the city are all priorities for me, and so I will commit that not all of the money will go to uh, to vehicular uh, but priorities, but I can't commit you, to one percent of those or another, not knowing what the scale of the bond is. Could you commit or when it would be to a, a minimum percentage of ten percent or something like that? Uh, again, I think this is kind of making up a number as we go along here. We just passed a forty million dollar road bond. So if this were tomorrow, frankly, we don't need to re-up road construction money, so I could probably commit to even more. But if all of this is 10 years from now, th that mix, I, I've tried very hard in this campaign to not make promises I can't keep. Uh, and, and we uh, respect uh, that. <laughs> um, so, and that leads into um, my next question, which relates to your answer to question four on um, keeping promises. So. Uh, as we're all aware, there were uh, extensive cuts to pensions in both Rhode Island uh, and Providence. And one of the controversial things in Rhode Island was that after the pensions were cut, a large portion of money was shifted into hedge funds, which pay high fees. I'm wondering uh, what your position is on hedge fund fees in Providence. Would you support uh, divesting from hedge funds, moving towards a more traditional uh, index fund and bond uh, investment strategy uh, that limits the fees Providence pays to Wall Street. So, uh, despite the fact that I've been to uh, business school for many years, uh, I'm not actually an investment professional, and uh, and and we have a board that is. Uh, I am very open-minded to and share your skepticism about the fees to which we pay hedge funds. Uh, and, and, and plan on working with our uh, Board of Pension Advisors to make sure that we are both mitigating risk but also maximizing returns after fees. And, uh, and so I intend to explore that and, and very open-minded to it and, and share your skepticism. Uh, but 
that's a decision that I'd like to make with the advice and counsel of people who actually do this for a living. And that makes sense. So uh, we're getting closer to our time limit, so we're going to ask you to keep your answers as brief and concise as possible. I this is coming right. from the king of content here. <laughs> I, I, you don't appreciate my nuance? I appreciate yeah. the time as a nuance as well. Sadly, this is the world we live in. Uh, so just two quick questions, yes or no questions, about uh, Providence's pension investments. Do you support Providence's moves to A, divest from fossil fuels and B, guns? Yes, it is. Excellent. Uh, now let's talk briefly about zoning. So This is not a brief topic. Right. It, is, it is a... <laughs> so Providence um, has a number of... Uh, has, a, has a zoning ordinance that has been criticized for causing segregation within the city for segregating into certain higher income, wealthier, whiter neighborhoods, lower income, more minor neighborhoods, keeping communities apart. Uh, one of these proposals, or one of the elements of this, is the R1 zones, which ban multifamily homes, which typically are lower income homes, uh, from parts of the city. And there's a proposal to expand the east side R1 zone to create what's called an exclusionary zone in order to keep out lower income people where the uh, minimum lot size is increased to 7,500 square feet to prevent density. Mm. Would you support um, stopping the uh, R1A zone, the exclusionary zone, and getting rid of the R1 zones? And would you support, um, it's a three zoning question, uh, allowing the height limit in downtown province to be lifted? Uh, so I would support allowing the height limit in downtown province to be lifted. Uh, I, I want to live in a city. That's why I live in Providence. I support additional density. I think additional density will support things like more transit users and, and more demand for bike lanes and all the things that I hold dear to me. And so I think additional density uh, downtown and in main commercial strips is a good thing. And, and, so, and I also support, by the way, the uh, removal of or the reduction of parking minimums and, and all the things that make for this to be a more transit-friendly, more bike-friendly, more pedestrian-friendly city as a result of increased density. Uh, I do not support eliminating the 1A zone. I think that's how the question was asked. Uh, the, the balance and the challenge is uh, I, of course, don't want to exclude low-income people from any neighborhood. Uh, the, the balance that needs to be struck, though, is around uh, the college campuses in particular, uh, the packing of students into, uh, into conversions uh, that make for massive student housing in the midst of residential uh, neighborhoods. And so that uh, is a real concern of mine. Uh, you can talk to many people in Elmhurst and Mount Pleasant about the impact that these party houses have on their neighborhood. Uh, and and uh, and the same is true for some areas around Brown, and so uh, the uh, the elimination of those zones would I think open the floodgates to that type of housing, uh, which would be detrimental to the quality of life for many of the people who live in and around the colleges. So I this is this is a, an interesting answer because I personally um, work as a graduate student at Brown, and I in fact live in a grandfathered in uh, multifamily home in an R1 zone. So is what you're saying that um, people like me shouldn't be uh, allowed to live in those sorts of communities? No, what I'm saying is that you're generally the exception and not the rule as to what a college kid lives and works and behaves like. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I, I, I agree. <laughs> I, I would, I, 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 I would, I think that's I think that's meant to be a compliment. It is. I'm not sure. Because <laughs> if there was any doubt, I was a college student like you were. Right? Good. <laughs> Good. Um, so a late night party in my house was ten thirty. <laughs> I I have to admit I went to bed at one a.m. last night. Oh. So. oh dear. Oh dear. So now let's talk about what I think is a, an issue where we have concerns with all the candidates is education. But just quickly, I want to ask one more segregation question, mm -hmm. which relates to a specific project in the Manton neighborhood uh, to build low-income apartments uh, in a relatively uh, middle-class part of the Manton neighborhood, mm -hmm. which uh, Council President Solomon uh, opposed. Would you have supported that project? I would have. Good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about education. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as you know, there was a controversial charter school that moved into Providence under the Mayoral Academy program, the Achievement First School. One of the controversial things about it is it has these management performance fees mm -hmm. that go back to the company that owns it. And many people have argued this forms a de facto for-profit or certainly a heavily corporatized approach to education. Right. And I'm wondering if you would have, had you been mayor, approved Achievement First. Uh, so, I mean, I think you know this, but the, the council president approved it and, and Jorge sits on the board of it. And, and so uh, I think that there is a, a real opportunity here um, to help sort out what I suspect is a tough decision for progressives in this election. And, and so uh, I think that uh, we have failed in the only, the only good part of char about charter schools is supposedly their ability to innovate and to use that innovation to uh, affect change in our public school system. And we're not doing that. And so we're kind of getting the worst of both worlds right now. Uh, we're getting uh, so resources drawn from the public first. school system. Uh, I am highly skeptical of Achievement First and, uh, and of corporate charters. And, uh, and I'm not sure, having been there and seen what the budgets and the options were at the time, what I would have done. Uh, but I know what I will do as mayor, which is to make sure that we are uh, taking what's working in the charters and taking them to the public school system and recognizing, frankly, that the charters don't get everything right and that there are things that are working in the public system that we should be taking to the charters, uh, that that, that uh, conduit needs to go both ways. And so uh, that's where I think what's practical in the future that we can and should address. It's prominent in my comprehensive schools plan, uh, and, and it remains where I'm focused. So I have read your schools plan, and one interesting part of it was uh, your proposal for uh, rewarding good teachers. Um, and I'm wondering how you propose to assess who is a good teacher and who is a bad teacher. Sure. I mean, the, the devil is always in the details, and I look forward to working with the teachers' union to together come to agreement on what is a fair and valid assessment. Uh, and, and I've been quite clear with teachers about that. Uh, and, and with everyone else that uh, other school districts around the country have been able to agree upon together in a collaborative way what is a fair assessment so that we together can identify who are the best teachers that may be interested in pursuing this optional track called a master teacher track. Uh, and, and, and I will find and I suggest to everyone here that anecdotally I think a lot of teachers in a school know who the best teachers are in their school. Uh, and so we together with teachers in a collaborative manner will agree upon an evaluation uh, that everyone believes in and trusts and, and then make this track available on an optional basis. Because I think great teachers should make, should make more than the principal. So you support merit pay? It's different than merit pay. This is a master teacher track. They're taking on additional responsibilities. They're taking on the responsibility of mentoring and training younger teachers because I think teaching is a craft refined over a lifetime and that we want to support our best teachers and lifelong teachers to stay in the classroom and not to bail for the administration or go be principals. And this is a way to do so that. So one more specific question, and then I'd like to open it up to other questions, um, is the, I know you, you were opposed to the proposal for the $15 minimum wage. I'm wondering if you would have supported the ballot initiative. The putting the question on the ballot? Right, so the other two candidates, my understanding is we're also opposed to the initial proposal, but supported uh, the city council vote to put it on the ballot, the ballot initiative. So, so I'm wondering whether you also would have supported uh, the ballot initiative. I, I, well, let me just say for the record here that I supported the, the, the theory and the concept behind uh, the wage proposal. I think that um, people who work full time should not have to struggle to make ends meet. I think that the um, majority of the people who work in our hotels are largely uh, women and women of color in particular, and that they are some of the most economically vulnerable in our city. Uh, but I, I think that the solution is through broad-based wage increases. I think we set a dangerous precedent by, by increasing wages one job classification as another. And so my concern with the ballot proposal is the same, which is that it is a dangerous and I think long-term unwieldy precedent to start raising wages one job classification at a time. The, the, the right and fair and I think 
just way forward is to raise wages across the board. Uh, and so uh, my primary concern is around this classification by classification wages. So would you support a, a, a proposal like Seattle's for a $15 minimum wage? I think that that is absolutely on the right track, and depending on how it was written, perhaps. Uh, but I think that classification by classification is asking for a mess in the long term. Okay, so I would like to open it up to other questions. We are somewhat limited in time, um, but we have a longer period, so I would like to have maybe five or ten minutes of questions. And let's try and keep the answers as short as possible. I may I'll get my best. Uh, the breakfasts. It seems like in the last couple of uh, questions and answers, there's been a focus on uh, competition based solutions. So, uh, in a sense at least, of uh, uh, the teachers, some sort of evaluation system where there's some sort of competition to determine who's uh, the best who gets put on this particular track that comes with more more pay, and also uh, in terms of uh, raising the minimum wage across the board, instead of picking out uh, certain industries, and uh, yet at the same time, uh, tag the nature of uh, tax exemptions and these uh, uh, tax treaties is that uh, it's not across the board, it is picking out certain industries. So I, I feel like there's a contradiction there where there are going to be uh, tax treaties that are continued and new tax treaties that are formed that are picking up, out uh, certain industries. Mm -hmm. But we take a look at something like hotels with 100 plus rooms or even 25 plus rooms and we know that these hotels aren't probably going to move, so it seems like some of these uh, industries are perfect targets for those same types of special treatment to workers uh, as the corollary to a special treatment for businesses. Uh, so, well, so, if I may, sure. uh, so just as a point of clarification, uh, with the proposed master teacher track, that's an optional thing. That's not a rewarding of the best. That's people who want to enter into that path if they're interested in doing so. Um, the question that didn't get asked is what would I like to do with tax treaties and tax stabilizations because I agree wholeheartedly with you that we are, in fact, currently in the business of picking winners and losers, and we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and so I support you know, wholesale reform of the way in which we offer tax stabilization agreements so that it is apolitical and administrative and as available to the bodega on Broad Street as it is to the business downtown on Westminster Street. Uh, and so I support a, a administrative program that anyone can apply for once they meet certain thresholds that offers them the exact same benefit uh, and in a way that no council or mayor could hold hostage so that they're not in fact rewarding friends uh, or picking favorites. Uh, and so uh, I think you're right to point out that as it is currently, there's some contradiction there. Uh, but the way I'd like to address that is to actually get out of the business of trying to reward uh, certain landlords and developers uh, and, and instead put in a structure whereby we can incentivize uh, development anywhere in the neighborhoods or downtown for anyone that qualifies. So, so since you said earlier that um, uh, you support paying for tax cuts, how would you have a plan for paying for that? And then I'd like to have yeah. Grant ask So, So I actually think that we should never do a tax abatement, which is to say that we should never as a city take less than we got in year one. I am interested in a... But paying for the stabilization, so you have a plan yeah, for Yeah, so, well, so here's the, and, and you and I have had this argument before, right? Um, my, my uh, preference is that we do a program whereby there would be a fixed rate of growth for a period of years to slow the rate of growth of taxes. So if you were to, for example, buy a vacant surface lot and build a building, you never, the city never gets less than it got in year one as a vacant surface lot. It's just that the developer gets to, or the landowner gets to get up to speed over time. And so your net, the city doesn't, and this is where Sam and I have a slight disagreement, the city does not, in fact, quote, lose money uh, because you never got less than you got in year one. The, 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 the valid counterpoint is um, what projects would have happened without that deal. Uh, and, and I don't think he and I will, at the end of the day, just agree to disagree on whether or not we could quantify whether or not the new projects stimulated 
would cover the projects that would have happened without the program, because that's a guess. Uh, and so, so uh, I would like how you would pay Grant for it is, the suggestion is that it may not cost us anything. Okay, so I would like to have Grant ask his question. So Mr. Smiley, um, I heard no on the income tax in Providence, and no to our uh, repeal of the tax cuts at the state level. Um, uh, I heard a lot of stuff about the, about the tax stabilizations, but you, the first thing that you said was you thought that this cliff, which was part of the agreement at the beginning and which they've had a decade to prepare for, is suddenly taking them by surprise and that's not fair to them. Uh, so no, 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 I, my, I, my reading of that is that you're, you would favor their proposal, which was to phase back in their, their, tax, their taxes that we're all paying at the full rate. I was wondering if there's any progressive uh, tax priority that you will say that you can commit to supporting. What about the estate tax? Can we tax dead rich people um, to fund our state's priorities? And also, um, candidates love to say, we've all heard, oh, well, we're going to grow the tax base, and as the economy grows, revenues will increase, and there'll be no need to increase taxes, and I'll lobby hard for the state to give us back our funding. But when the state tells you to pound sand, and when the economy continues to putter along, what will your priorities then be? Will you then come to us and say, gosh, I'm so sorry, I just can't bring myself to raise um, the car tax rate, so we're just going to have to leave the floor at the bottom, and I'm so sorry, I have alligator tears for all the people in Providence who are still paying, but we just didn't grow the tax base, and it's the state's fault for not paying us. I would like to hear what your what your thoughts would be in that not unlikely scenario. Well, uh, there were a couple points there. One is I do support an estate tax. And, Thank you. And uh, uh, and I I do support the phasing out of the most regressive tax, which is the car tax, which I think is a progressive idea. Uh, and uh, I don't think that it's alligator tears, but the we're going to have to advocate for more from the state. And, and that's not just some nonsensical thing that any candidate will say. We, in fact, had serious cuts exacted on us by the Kachiri administration and then continued in the early years and the Chafee years. That was real. I'm and, not saying it was real. I'm saying it's liable to continue. It's liable to continue, but that doesn't mean that a good mayor can't make it happen. We're going to have a new governor uh, who very likely is going to be from the city of Providence, thank God, and, uh, and, and, and believes in cities. I mean, I don't know if, if you all know, the, the, what brought me to Rhode Island was I was the campaign manager for Charlie Fogarty in 2006. And, and nobody is more filled with regret and remorse for not having been able to find 7,500 extra votes on election day in 2006 because it was the Kachiri years and someone who saw our cities as the source of problems as opposed to the source of strength and solutions and what's special about this place that screwed us. And, and I am very interested in and think that I will be very effective at, at continuing to advocate for the restoration of the cuts that have been pushed upon us and for real and sustained partnerships uh, in the sharing of expenses in our capital city with so much of our land being tax exempt. The other piece that we haven't talked about at all is getting more out of the nonprofits because it's not just the government that occupies tax exempt space in our city. And so uh, in my economic development plan, I directly address uh, continued negotiations with the colleges and the university and the hospitals for which they don't currently make any payment. Uh, and so there are places for additional revenue. Uh, I do intend to go get them, and I am committed to uh, starting to eliminate the most regressive tax, which is the car tax. So thank you. I think we do want to have our candidates on the record supporting some sort of progressive tax proposal that would increase taxes in a progressive way. So I want to ask you about one more of them, which is the uh, during the Tavares administration, there was a uh, uh, a plan where the rate on home value over a million dollars for the larger mansions in the city uh, was increased. And this went away during uh, the restructuring of the homestead exemption. And I'm wondering if you would support reinstating it um, uh, given approval from the state to do so. Uh, I would not. Okay. Are there any other questions? in the audience.
All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Can I say something else? Absolutely. So, because I'm not sure everyone knows all of my history, I'd like to take just 90 seconds to wrap up, if I may. Um, I grew up in Chicago, and uh, when I graduated college, uh, I owned to DePaul. And when I graduated college, it was also right around the same time that I came out as a gay man. And, and having spent my high school years getting thrown into lockers and, uh, and otherwise harassed, I immediately got involved with uh, a group called GLSEN, which is the Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network that does anti-bullying work in schools. And, uh, and this was, you know, it wasn't that long ago, but it was still a time in which this was commonly referred to, oh, that's just boys being boys, as opposed to, you know, a much more serious attention to bullying that we see today, and we've seen tremendous progress. And I went to school to be an accountant, and my first job was, you know, a professional accounting firm, and I took a leave of absence to go work on a ballot initiative in Oregon uh, in 2000. It was the No on Nine campaign, which was the so-called No Promo Homo Law, which was that for if a school sanctioned homosexuality, they would lose all of their public school funding. Uh, so teaching things like how you might contract HIV and AIDS in health class could cut a school off. It was crazy. Uh, and so I moved out there for a month, took a leave of absence. We won, although 52-48. And, and, and I caught the bug and started working in progressive politics ever since. I have worked for progressive Democrats across the country. I landed here in Rhode Island in 2006 to try to get Charlie Fogarty elected. Since that time, since I've been here, in addition to starting a business that is focused on working for Democrats across the country, I've helped pass the affordable housing bond campaign. I was the lead lobbyist for marriage equality. I have been an outspoken advocate and the only candidate on the record for the, the regulation and taxation and legalization of marijuana. As far as I know, I'm the only publicly pro-choice candidate in this race and have spent a lot of time raising money for Planned Parenthood and for joining with them side by side at the State House while lobbying at the State House. I'm the only candidate with an actual LGBT agenda for this city. It's not enough to just march in the Pride Parade, but we actually have a, a, an agenda to move the bar. Uh, I was the lead lobbyist for payday loan reform. Uh, and while I'm deeply saddened that we didn't win, as mayor, I will throw the full weight of this office behind making sure that we do, and actually through zoning, we can at least force them out of the city of Providence. I have a track record of real work and accomplishments on behalf of a wide variety of progressive causes, and either as a volunteer, as an activist, or as a paid professional, this has been my career. It, which is why it would be so meaningful to me if I could earn your support. Uh, I have tremendous respect for the work that you've all done. I think we have a lot of work to do at the State House, and I hope we can do it together, uh, knowing that you have a champion in the mayor's office. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that we can work together for the last six weeks of this campaign. So thank you. Thank you so much. For